EPSP and IPSP that is the excitatory postsynaptic potential and inhibitory postsynaptic potential are the graded potentials which develop on the postsynaptic membrane. We know that synapse is basically a connection between the two neurons that consists of basically a presynaptic membrane that is the exon terminal of one neuron and a postsynaptic membrane which is the dendrite of another neuron. So the signal travels from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron and because of this there is a change in potential on the postsynaptic membrane and this change in potential can be either depolarization. Depolarization is basically change in potential towards the positive side or towards less negative right or there can be hyperpolarization as well okay so hyperpolarization is change in potential towards more negative side so if rmp is minus 70 millivolt change in potential towards minus 60 millivolt is uh, depolarization and change in potential towards minus 80 millivolt is hyperpolarization so when the change in potential is towards the positive side or towards less negative that is basically EPSP, excitatory post synaptic potential because this is the synapse and the potential is developing on the post synaptic membrane. So, excitatory post synaptic potential and the hyperpolarization that is known as IPSP that is inhibitory post synaptic potential. So, how these potentials are developing and how EPSP and IPSP either may lead to generation of action potential or not lead to generation of action potential, we will see. So, first of all, just the basic concept of synaptic transmission, how it happens. Well, whenever there is a action potential which reaches to the exon terminal, there is opening of the voltage gated calcium channels. So in green here are shown voltage gated calcium channels which open causing entry of calcium from the extracellular fluid into the exon terminal and this calcium causes release of the neurotransmitter which is present in the vesicles. So because of this calcium these vesicles move towards the membrane and fuse with the presynaptic membrane causing the release of the uh, neurotransmitter which is present in the vesicles and uh, the neurotransmitter in turn binds with the receptors which are present on the postsynaptic membrane and upon binding with the receptors there are certain changes which happen on the postsynaptic membrane that lead to change in the movement of the ions and uh, whenever there is change in the movement of the ions there is change in the potential. So let us see that how this is occurring. So first is how excitatory postsynaptic potential is occurring. So these uh, neurotransmitters which are released, they bind to the receptors and generally the neurotransmitter which leads to excitatory postsynaptic potential very common in central nervous system is glutamate. There are obviously other neurotransmitters also, but uh, this lecture is not about uh, in detail about the neurotransmitters. Okay, so we are just giving a classic example of a neurotransmitter which uh, leads to excitatory postsynaptic potential. Now, when this glutamate binds to the receptors which are present on the postsynaptic membrane, there are mechanisms which can lead to movement of ions and of these the mechanism is opening of ligand gated sodium channels and when there is opening of ligand gated sodium channels, sodium enters from outside into the postsynaptic membrane. So, a positive ion is entering and this leads to positive change in potential. Okay. Now, this is very common. We all know about it. Second mechanism can be closure of potassium channels. So, these potassium channels are open before. Okay. In resting state, they are open. And the binding of the neurotransmitter causes closure of these potassium channels. So, in the open state, what would have happened? The potassium might be continuously leaking from the cell. Right. So, when these channels close, what will happen? Potassium will not be able to leak out of the cell and there will be potassium increase in the postsynaptic neuron, right? So, positive ion is being retained. So, that is the decreased efflux of potassium ions and that can also lead to depolarization. So, these are two mechanisms for depolarization or EPSP to occur that is entry of sodium ion and decreased efflux of potassium ions. 
so here in this graphical manner what we are seeing is that on x axis is shown time in milliseconds so here this is time in milliseconds and on y axis is membrane potential in millivolts right and uh, what we are seeing that this blue line is showing the resting membrane potential so minus 70 millivolt is the resting membrane potential and this green line is showing the threshold potential that means for action potential to occur there should be a change in potential towards the positive side such that it reaches the threshold isn't it but here you see what is happening because of the signal which is coming from the presynaptic neuron there is epsp excitatory postsynaptic potential that is basically changing the potential towards the positive side but this epsp is not leading to action potential remember okay so this is a graded potential occurring which is not able to generate the action potential so please remember that this epsp and ipsp are actually graded potential we will see the properties very soon so these are graded potentials fine so that was about epsp let's move on to ipsp so how will ipsp occur ipsp we said is basically change in potential towards a more negative side right hyperpolarization so that occurs when there is either opening of a chloride channel so opening of ligand gated chloride channel when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor there is opening of this uh, chloride channel and because of this there is entry of chloride ions into the dendrite and this negative ion being inside leads to hyperpolarization and classical neurotransmitters in central nervous system are gaba and glycine which cause inhibitory postsynaptic potential but there is another mechanism also of inhibitory postsynaptic potential and that is opening of ligand gated potassium channels so opening of ligand gated chloride channels and opening of ligand gated potassium channels why because you see potassium ion is more inside right so when these potassium channels open what will happen there will be more efflux of potassium ions from inside to the outside thus causing less positivity inside that is there will be negativity less positivity is nothing but negativity right so opening of ligand gated chloride channels opening of ligand gated potassium channels causes ipsp on the other hand epsp was due to opening of ligand gated sodium channels and closure of ligand gated potassium channels understanding so these two mechanisms each for epsp and ipsp we should remember so let us see the same way in diagrammatic manner what is happening here again the x axis is showing time in milliseconds and y axis is showing membrane potential in millivolt and what we are seeing here this is the resting membrane potential minus 70 millivolt and there is decrease in the potential due to this signal which is coming from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron so here also again it is written activation of the synapse but here basically any potential change which is occurring that is a synaptic transmission which is occurring and causing that potential change but you see here that when ipsp is occurring it is taking the potential away from the threshold potential epsp was taking the potential towards the threshold potential but ipsp is taking the potential away from the threshold potential so if this neuron has to generate an action potential now the change in potential which will be required is from much below maybe minus 80 millivolt till here right so it is becoming less responsive okay so maybe there might be another stimulus which is causing uh, maybe uh, excitatory change but you know that uh, now that excitatory change required is much more because ipsp is also there so that is the significance of this epsp and ipsp that is making the neuron either more responsive or less responsive to another stimulus right now this epsp and ipsp remember they are graded potential that means they have the same property as of any graded potential and what are the properties one very important uh, property is that that if the signal increases if the signal increases that means the potential change will increase meaning that means if the amount of the neurotransmitters which are released from the presynaptic neuron increase 
then the potential change in the postsynaptic neuron will be more in case of EPSP and much more hyperpolarization in case of IPSP. So, increase in the stimulus is leading to increase in the potential change. That is why it is known as graded potential, right? And it is not an all or none law following potential. That is action potential. Fine. Second very important property is that it travels with decrement. What does this mean? That means if at the site of the synapse, maybe the potential change is minus 10 millivolt. That is IPSP, right? So from minus 70 millivolt, the potential has actually changed to minus 80 millivolt. Now, this potential change travels along the exon, right? As it travels along the exon, what happens that slowly, slowly there is loss in the potential. So here, the potential change may be minus 80 millivolt. Here again, it may be minus 79 millivolt. Then here it may be minus 78 millivolt. So you see, as it is traveling along the length of the dendrite, the loss in potential is occurring. So that is travels with decrement. Action potential, does it travel like that? No. Action potential travels without decrement. And third very important property is that it can be summed up. It can be added up. Okay, that we'll see in detail. What is that? See, now here is one neuron and this is the axon and this is the cell body and there are so many dendrites, right? Now, for simplicity sake, I have just shown one dendrite with one synapse, okay? Now, you see that maybe this synapse, there is generation of EPSP. Other synapse, there may be generation of IPSP. And you see the quantity also. EPSP here changes 8 millivolt. IPSP here changes minus 10 millivolt. Then there may be another synapse where EPSP is 15 millivolts. Okay. And maybe other synapse which is not active. And so in that case, there will be no change in potential. Now, because these uh, potential change travel with decrement, you see, by the time they reach the cell body, what is happening? IPSP from minus 10 millivolt, it has become minus 7 millivolt. EPSP from 8, it has become 5 millivolt. And similarly, EPSP here from 15 millivolt, it has become 10 millivolt. And you can uh, very logically say that if the dendrite is long, then what will happen? The loss in the potential, which will be much longer by the time it reaches the cell body. Now, they have reached here at a common point, right? And uh, maybe they will travel like that. So, by the time they come together in, at a particular point on the membrane, what will happen? That all these potential will get added up. Why? See, these are nothing but ionic changes. So, whatever is the summed up ionic change, that will be the actual potential. So that is known as summation of the postsynaptic potential. All the graded potentials can be added up. While action potential, it cannot be added up. It is an all or none phenomena. And that is because of the inactivation of the sodium channels and all. We are not going into uh, details of that. But just remember here that graded potential can be added up. It doesn't follow all or none law. So just a little summary about that. Different EPSP and IPSP travel with decrement towards cell body. The longer the dendrite, the decrement will be more. Finally, they will be added up. And depending on the net result of summation of EPSP and IPSP, action potential may or may not be generated. Fine. Now, let us see the types of synaptic uh, summation of these EPSP and IPSP. So, first is summation in space, also known as a spatial summation. So, here what we are seeing that there are three the synapses okay so the line diagram i have drawn for simplicity and they are impinging on another another neuron now suppose that all these three synapses are activated simultaneously so all these three synapses will cause change in the potential on the postsynaptic membrane one may be epsp one may be ipsp or all three may be epsp or all three may be ipsp that is different but uh, suppose they come together, so what will be the ultimate change in potential on the postsynaptic neuron? They will be added up and that will determine. So this is known as summation in a space where the potential change caused by three different neurons in this example, that is being added up. So these three different neurons are differently located uh, in uh, space, as you may say, right? So 
this adding up of change in potential caused by different synapses that is known as spatial summation and uh, let us see it graphically how it will be so here is an example uh, where you see that these are the presynaptic neurons which are making contact with the postsynaptic neuron and ex is showing basically excitatory uh, synapse and in 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 is inhibitory synapse now suppose ex1 gets excited only only ex1 right so here this green line is showing the threshold and say suppose this is the resting membrane potential suppose only ex1 is excited or uh, the synapse is activated so what will happen we will get a positive change in potential but it is not reaching to the threshold now given a condition where both ex1 and ex2 are excited so the summed up change in potential will occur right so they are acting together and what will happen we will get maybe a, a greater potential which reaches through the threshold and there will be generation of action potential okay so this is the point where two uh, excitatory synapses are excited together so what is this this is summation let's take another example say suppose excitatory synapse 1 and inhibitory synapse 1 are excited and uh, maybe quantitatively for simplicity let us say that this causes a uh, plus 10 millivolt change in potential and this one causes minus 10 uh, change in potential so if both of them are excited simultaneously how much will be the potential change nothing there will be no potential change right adding up is not causing any potential change so that is spatial summation next is temporal summation here temporal when we are talking it is in relation with time so here i have shown only one synapse okay so now if this synapse is activated repeatedly so suppose there is a train of action potentials here right so lot of action potentials are coming one after the other and they are activating this particular synapse so maybe one action potential from the presynaptic neuron is causing a epsp on the postsynaptic neuron of 3 millivolts suppose so it will fade with time remember fade with time also so one is that it travels with decrement and second is that at a particular position it will not stay forever right so after some time it will become two millivolt after some time it will become one millivolt and it will decay with time right now as it is decaying before its complete decay to zero millivolt suppose another uh, action potential comes right so this action potential will again generate a epsp of three millivolt and epsp due to the previous signal was suppose two millivolt because one millivolt has faded so how much will be the epsp now it will be 3 plus 2 is equal to 5 millivolt so the excitatory postsynaptic potential from the two, two signals have actually added up right so that is known as summation with time that is temporal summation similar will be the case in ipsp also so maybe initially there was a change of minus 10 millivolt okay and then there will be decay so it is going to become minus 9 millivolt minus 8 millivolt and maybe now another signal is added up here that is minus 10 millivolt so how much will be the epsp it will be much more negative that is minus 19 millivolt understanding so that is summation of the epsps and ipsps fine so if we see it graphically in this same example so here excitatory stimulus is there only one stimulus comes so it will be like this right and then it will start decaying right now as it is decaying again maybe the next stimulus comes in the same synapse so what will happen it will add up and it will increase to this level and again if the same stimulus comes right so it was decaying and again it will add up and you see the third time it may reach the threshold so if the frequency of stimuli is more in case of an excitatory synapse ultimately it will lead to generation of the action potential so what is the point of all this thing point is basically that generally a stimulation in a single synapse doesn't lead to action potential it is the combination of the synapse which are being activated that ultimately will determine whether the postsynaptic neuron will fire or not and depending on how much is the added potential so here you see epsp is much more than that of the threshold right so you see here is the threshold 
so this is the action potential frequency another example you see that if the threshold is here and the summated potential is much more higher than that of the threshold here it is only this much okay then the frequency of action potentials is much much more so here this diagram is showing only the action potential so in this the action potential frequency is less in the other one action potential frequency is much more now before we end this uh, concept on epsp and ipsp i want to talk about the presynaptic inhibition what is presynaptic inhibition here you see this diagram is showing one excitatory synapse right and this excitatory synapse is being inhibited right so on the exon there is an inhibitory signal this synapse is not here right so if the synapse was here that is known as direct inhibition now this is what is known as presynaptic inhibition because it is the presynaptic neuron which is being inhibited okay now suppose one action potential causes the release of uh, maybe 100 neurotransmitters right just simplistic uh, values we are taking and uh, 100 neurotransmitters lead to say suppose this much potential change okay now suppose this excitatory synapse the presynaptic inhibition is present that means this one is activated but by means of another neuron this is inhibited also understanding so maybe instead of 100 neurotransmitters now only 50 neurotransmitters will be released because of this inhibition the amount of voltage gated calcium channels which will be opening are very less so the fusion of the vesicles will also decrease so that is why the neurotransmitters are going to decrease okay and here in this diagram if we see it has shown that okay with inhibition total inhibition of the neurotransmitters is occurring that means no release is occurring but uh, generally it doesn't happen uh, like that uh, it may be partial inhibition also right uh, so if epsp without this pre synaptic inhibition was uh, say plus 10 millivolt with the presynaptic inhibition the epsp may be only say suppose plus 8 millivolt or plus 7 millivolt understanding so that is the concept of presynaptic inhibition this is not direct inhibition but still the amount of epsp which is being generated at a particular synapse is being less because of the presynaptic inhibition so that was all about the concept of epsp and ipsp how they are generated what are they how they are summed up and when they will lead to the generation of action potential thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open thank you